Today, we have a very special guest with us, Jewel Baraka. She is truly a warrior, and you are going to find out why. Let me tell you a little bit about Jewel. I've been waiting. I will say, uh, I was just telling her this before we started, to speak with her. And I'm so honored that she's taking the time today. And there's a three-hour time difference, so I'm thanking her for coming on early in the day with me uh, because her voice is so important for you, the public, you, the warriors, to understand truly the reality. And speaking of reality, I'm throwing out right now a bit of a warning. You're going to be uh, hearing things about the sex industry, porn industry, sexual exploitation, whatever else we come up with. But this is reality, so buckle up because it is a sensitive topic, all of these things, we know this, but if we don't discuss this, then we cannot create change. And you know, our warriors hashtag is community creates change. And that is what Jewel and I are out to do today. So Jewel Baraka is a survivor and she doesn't mind that word. And she is a warrior, an advocate, a writer, MMA, we have to get into this, enthusiast and a beach lover. Mm -hmm. That's, that sounds good, Jewel. Jewel has yeah. taken her own path and her trauma. And that's why we are so thankful to Jewel for sharing bravely her story. And she's moving forward, not only for herself, but for all of you. And she uses her very strong voice right now, uh, with along with other survivors and advocates, to really shine this light. We need this light to shine so brightly on these subjects um, about all of this exploitation, these human rights violations in the sex industry. And Jewel right now is working, well, she's doing a, a lot of things we're going to hear about, uh, as a crisis response survivor, advocate, counseling, and connecting trafficking victims identified in hospitals with resources, referrals, and care to empower them because we are reclaiming lives. That is what Jewel is doing. Now you know why I am calling Jewel Baraka a warrior. Um, she walks the walk, not just talks the talk. I think that's what it is, Jewel, something like that that's saying. Uh, but Jewel has a new book out, and I urge all of you, when we are done here, and it'll be in the body of the video, you are to purchase this book. You are to support Jewel and the work she does, and you are to understand the reality of all of this. It's called Coming of Age on a Porn Set, Trafficked in Porn at Age 14. And you know what? Jewel has a quote, and I love this so much, on the cover of the book. Sometimes in the fight, you find the warrior you always were the website. Again, everything will be in the body of the video. I want all of you to take your time and read things later when we're done. JewelBaraka.com. It's your story to tell, Jewel. So welcome. Welcome to the Warriors. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And um, I just want to say one thing before we continue is that Jewel is spelled with two L's. So jewelbaraka.com. Oh, don't you worry. I got it in my notes with two L's. <laughs> and and I I'm going to load the body of the video. It's going to have all your stuff. Okay. So you, you are going to, no, you are going to, they're <laughs> going to be like this jewel. We're tired of her because <laughs> Warriors has her all over plastered on everything because also we want to promote the book. We will put the book out. I'll tell you in advance. We'll put this out as our November book of the month because we have oh, a book of the month all the time. So already, if you approve, we'll put it out, you know, an email blast everybody uh, with the book. Um, let's start wherever you want to start. Again, I always say it's your story to tell. Yeah. So start sharing, Jewel, anything about yourself. It could be about from now. It could be about before we get into the book and, and other things, you know, you as a child, the floor mm -hmm. is yours, whatever you want to start with. Okay. Well, let me start with what I call the one minute version <laughs> of my story um, that I often give in trainings. And um, so basically I was um, trafficked when I was 11 by my father. So it'd be familial trafficking, which is, accounts for about 40% of trafficking in the United States. Um, he had been um, my abuser before that. So really since the age of five, I had been experiencing sexual violation of different kinds with him. Um, but at 11, he trafficked me into what was um, basically an underage brothel. Um, and then, and I was trafficked there for about three years. And then when I was 14, I was trafficked um, on an adult hardcore porn set. Um, and I say it that way. I know that most people don't use the word hardcore now. 
but really hardcore means that all the sex and violence is real. And so that's why I use that term. Um, and it also that it also tends towards a more extreme or graphic nature. Um, and so that's um, why I express it that way. And um, that trafficking lasted for three years on the adult hardcore porn set. Um, there are many things, um, I always say in our lives that they're both fortunate and unfortunate things. Um, and the one fortunate thing of being trafficked in porn was that um, after that three years, they were, they're always looking for the new girl. And so after that three years, they were tired of me. And basically we filmed a final scene to um, kind of wrap up my character or story. And, and then they didn't come for me again. And, and that happened the uh, spring of my senior year in high school. And so for the last few years of my um, senior year, I got to pretend like I'd been a normal teen all along and celebrate along with my friends. So that was um, that's the fortunate ending of my story. And then it took me another year to get away from my father. Um, but from that point that I did, I moved far away from him then I just focused on healing. And um, so that's, um, yeah, so that's um, that been a huge part of my story. And part of why I put that tagline, sometimes in the fight, we find the warrior, we always were. Um, it's part of my story in fighting my way out of the trafficking, but it's also part of my story in fighting through the healing to rise and speak my story and advocate for others. Mm. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm going to keep telling you this. I'm very sorry you had to endure this and go through this. I am thrilled to meet you and that you are sharing to empower others. You know, it's remarkable that you're doing this because it's exactly what is needed. Um, so other people, you know, uh, don't feel like they're alone. Yes. They, they, right. And um, I mentioned to you earlier, like I've never been trafficked. So I can talk till I'm blue in the face, but I can give you a platform to come yeah. forward. And that's what resonates with the public. I have to ask you, and please answer any way you see fit. So basically you aged out of the porn industry is what is what we say in New York. Yeah. They didn't try to force you into like an adult brothel or into an, a, you know, walking the streets or something. They just let you go. Well, that's, um, I mean, and you read more about it in my book when I talk about the transition between the underage brothel and the adult hardcore porn set. Um, but basically at the point that I was looking too old for their demographic at the brothel, that's when they moved me into um, the adult hardcore porn set. And at that point, they kind of shopped me around. Like they tried different things. Um, I think the street was an option. Um, but I didn't end up there. They tried to club. So there were different, they seem, it seemed to be, um, people often ask me, was it organized crime? And, and I just say, I don't know. It was organized. It was connected. There was definitely connections yeah. because like the brothel was not the same owners as the porn set, but somehow they were sharing people a little bit. So. Well, you know, and we're finding out Jewel, like really this all goes back to organized crime. It is all interconnected. We think of it like a big wheel with a lot of spokes and they're all connected. It is very well organized. And I've heard you say that, you know, in other uh, talks I've listened to other interviews and things like that. But I was talking about um, when you were like 17. Yeah. You know, yeah, 18. So what, you know, what you, so you said the good news was, you know, you kind of had this, this year in high school where you were kind of a normal, for lack of a better word, right? Yeah, the last three months of my senior year, yeah. Kind of thing. Now, I know you have a mom. You have, mm -hmm. do you have, how many siblings do you have? The one, the sister? I have, I had one, yeah, one sister. Okay, yeah. so I have, and I have to ask you this, and please, again, you'll you'll answer any way you're comfortable or, or at, as a mom and as your sibling, where were they during all this? Obviously, they were there in the home. Mm -hmm. Explain if you want your family dynamic a little bit. Sure. Um, and yeah, and then just to and just to follow up on what you asked before is 
I, I don't know the real reason that they let me go in the end. Um, maybe it had to do with the contract my dad had with them. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, but they didn't try to move me on after that. They were done with me. So, um, but then going back to how, how this happened, that's a question I get all the time. Um, where was your mom? I think that's mm -hmm. the biggest question. Um, and the way that I would describe it is um, in two, two directions. One is that she was basically an emotional child inside. Um, I was mm -hmm. always her mother in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, she was always lost in what I um, called kind of her, her um, fantasy world. I mean, even till the last time I spoke with her, she would always say, we have the perfect family. We have the perfect family. So she was just not at all connected to reality, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't mean that she couldn't like operate in the outside world because she did um, like organize events. And so she was able to function in a, in that way in the world, but just emotionally, she was like a kid inside. And I, I'm probably in denial. I don't mean to interrupt in oh, denial. Yeah. What, what about, cause I am jumping in now. So excuse me, but. Was she, was she um, a victim of violence? Do we know as a child or through your father? What do we know about her? Well, I'm sure she was because he yeah. was a, probably a clinical psychopath. Um, he's very um, methodical in the way he abused all of us. So he never abused us in front of each other. Um, like, so there wouldn't be witnesses. Like, that's just... Mm -hmm. He, he just had that kind of mind. He, I always say he was playing a chess game um, with life and we were the pieces he was moving around to his best advantage. And um, so I'm sure there was abuse with him. Um, I think she probably, there was probably abuse before she met him because I, I don't know how you would pick a guy like him if there wasn't. Um, but I am sure there was abuse with him and I am sure there was abuse of my sister. Um, although she tended to follow a little bit after my mom in the denial sense and um, never really told me about the abuse, but there were clear signs that she was being at least abused by my father. She didn't go with me to, um, like my dad would put me in the car with basically who, two men who were like the transport that would take me to the brothel and later to the studio. And um, she wasn't with me. So I don't know that she was trafficked, but she was definitely abused by my father. Um, so it's just a, what Secret. you would say is there's an atmosphere of fear that everybody mm -hmm. is afraid of him and trying to survive. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, where did you grow up? Portland, Oregon. Portland. Um, you brought up something before that we do not talk enough about and is so prevalent. I mean, you're in California right now. I'm in New York City. New York um, is this familial trafficking. Yeah. It seems to be, and there is so much of it. You know, we talk a lot about strangers and internet, which all happens, you know, predators, traffickers, pimps. But there is so much really with familial trafficking that nobody's discussing. Explain for our listener what that is, right? Because you know, and I know, they may not know. They may not know that they're a, a victim of this because they don't understand. It might be normal to them in their yeah. own household. Explain familial trafficking and share with us any anything you know about today in 2024, what's going on with familial trafficking. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start there. So familial trafficking makes up about 40% of the trafficking in the United States. And what it means um, is anybody related to you. So it could be um, a husband, a father, mother, brother, cousin, uncle, um, but they are the trafficker. And let me stop on that word for a second. So a lot of times we think trafficker and we see stranger in our mind. Um, and we also see like a pimp on the street, right? So he that he's managing every transaction. But really just um, the definition of trafficking is that you're providing 
someone for the purpose of commercial sex, which is sex for money, right? And if they're a minor, then that's all you need to establish sex trafficking. Um, if they're an adult, then you have to have show like force, fraud, or coercion, which is um, in the familial sense is often coercion, right? You have this relationship that um, is creating the, is moving you towards the trafficking, right? Is um, kind of the, it is a force. I still consider it a force, but it may not be a gun yeah. at your head, right? Um, and yeah, so that's kind of what familial trafficking looks like um, and how common it is in the United States. And yet we're still like focused on the, the yeah. pimp on the street kind of look. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think it's very important that we really bring familial trafficking out to the forefront because I know in New York, we have reports, Jewel, it's like over 60% of all. And if that's what they're telling us, like we have reports of this and studies, who knows yeah. what it could be, right? It's so yeah. important. That's um, really hard to get. I want, I want to circle back. Something I always wonder about, and we, again, another another topic we don't talk a lot about, again, you answer any way you see fit, is is I always wonder about a young girl's body or a young woman's body going through all of this trauma. Hmm. Uh, obviously, we have mental, psychological trauma. We don't talk enough about the healthcare aspect of, I, I don't really know, and stop me if you want, like how a body endures this kind of abuse. You know, hmm. several men a night, you, I like that you say hardcore because people have to understand like this is horrific. Like, you know, we can't yeah. sugarcoat it. Do you want to speak about that at all? Yeah, I think that that's really important. Like one of the when I do my training on trafficking and porn, one of the myths I talk about is that people subconsciously think because it's a film that um, the sex and violence isn't real. Right. Um at the end of every Hollywood movie, we see the tagline, no animals were hurt in the filming of this. And we just imply in our mind that no humans were hurt either, right? And that's true for the most part for Hollywood films, but in porn, that's not true, right? There's actual harm happening um, in, mo in many cases to the people involved in it. And so I just think it's important to understand that as we consider as a culture, how, how to help um, the humans in porn because um, everybody has a right to live a life free of harm. And so we want everybody to have that opportunity. Um, yeah. And, and to be safe. I mean, that, that, you know, that's just, it, it, it sounds almost a little crazy what we're talking about, but that's another program. I won't go there. What, what do you think um, right now, I won't go there because I keep you on all day asking a million questions. Um, and we know we're going to have a multi-part. You'll come back, you know, more frequently and talk with us and share with us. Um, tell us, obviously, you know, the internet has really, and the algorithms, we have all the studies, kids are being fed porn. That's the way I look at it, Jewel. You yeah. know, they may not even be looking for it, but there's a deluge now. Um, share with us, what, when you do a training or something like that, do you touch upon the internet and what the internet is doing to society and, and, and how about kids in particular? Because I've spoken to kids that are now maybe in their twenties who told me they saw things, you know, at 10 or 11, they can't unsee. Right. Like it's, it's just there. It's traumatizing. So what do you have to say about all of this? Well, I would start from my own story and I would say um, two things. One is that I don't ever want kids to see the kind of porn that I was trafficked in, right? It it traumatized me. It would traumatize them. And so I'm going to start from that personal place and then also say that um, my when we were done shooting my first film, they had me watch it um, with a whole theater full of men and seeing it traumatized me um it also woke me up it's and it's kind of what initiated that fight to survive um that i credit for being alive and breathing and and where i am today but um that was kind of a you know side 
like I said, a fortunate thing of <laughs> an unfortunate moment. Um, so that's what I would say, first of all. Um, I would say, second of all, if if you want to know more about um, how this is impacting children, please read Raised on Porn by Benjamin Nolo. Yes. It's an amazing book on that topic. Um, I And then the other thing to know is that if you find um, CSAM or what, what was previously called child porn online, you can report it to the National um, Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And they have a tip line that um, you can report yeah. it to. And, and they report, um, I can't remember the exact number, but I mean, since they started their tip line, it's like 80 billion reports or something like that, which sounds like a lot, but I, I'm guessing it's probably low when you put it over the number of years they've had their tip lines. So. Um, I know in 2023, they had 36 million reports of CSAM alone, the child sexual abuse material. So we're waiting for the 2024 and that's what's reported, right? Because all of these things are under reported Absolutely. kind of thing, but it's cybertipline.org. We'll have all this also in the body of the video. So everybody has their tools, their resources. Um, you know, I want, I want to um, ask you, what about your family today? I have not been in contact for, with them for about two decades now. Um, it took a, a little while. I didn't just like cut them off, um, partly because it wasn't safe for me because of the way my father was and because he had been connected to my traffickers. Um, I mean, he was my trafficker in the sense he received money for me, but he wasn't at the brothel or the studio, but he was connected to those people. And so um, I took my time, but then at the point I was strong enough and healed enough to do it, then I disconnected from them. Um, and I took, yeah. And that was important. That was an important part of going forward in my hard. life. It's hard. It was hard. Yeah. Most it's people don't do it. And I got a lot of grief. <laughs> you know, I, I've been in, in and out of the church as I healed. And I got a lot of grief from some people in the church about doing that because they're you know, there's just this idea of like a mis a mixed up idea of what forgiveness is and um and that it it means you remain connected to perpetrators forever. <laughs> and that's right. not the case. You know. Um so yeah. It, it, either way, it is so hard, I would imagine, you know. Yeah. Um I, I I can't even imagine right? Because I haven't been through anything like this, just family issues, right? Everybody always has family issues. It's always yeah. hard to disconnect from one's family. Um, so we have yeah. to applaud you for that. What about any kind of, do, do you think your father was involved in trafficking other girls outside of your family? We don't really know about your sister, right? We, yeah. Or do you think he was just somebody who got paid to traffic you part of this organized crime ring? I'm going to call it that. We don't really know, yeah. but I'm going to call it that. Well, I, I, you know, I feel st strongly, which I write um, quite a, quite a bit throughout the book, is that I, when I don't know the backstory, I don't. I mean, I offer comment. a couple speculations, but I don't really know. <laughs> right. So I don't know how he got connected um, to the trafficking ring. I I speculate that maybe there was blackmail um, in addition to the money. I mean, also. I think he was a clinical psychopath, which might be a reason enough in itself. Um, but as to your question, I don't think he was trafficking anybody else um, just because of the methodical nature of him. Like he was, his image was his most prized possession. Um, he was a pastor, a community leader, and, and he always wanted that good guy image. And right. so because of that, he, it's like he, um, like I said, he was into chess. So it, it's like um, it wouldn't be a good chess move to like reach outside of the family. Right. Private. Keep it private, secretive, yeah. whatever. Um, you'll, you'll like this. I just I just got a notification that um, the book was delivered to my. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll have it read for next time uh, when we chat, but at least it's here. Um, let me ask you something. Did any adult that you can remember, whether it was the brothel, 
um, whether it was, and you said this brothel, I don't know if you mentioned it right now, but I, I've heard you in other things, it was made up of children. It was made up of girls, yeah. right? Underage girls. Did yeah. any adult there ever try to reach out to you uh, to help or on this porn set that you can, uh, did anybody ever say anything to you? No. Nothing. No. Um, the, yeah, the, the sex, um, the underage brothel was, yeah, their sex buyer demographic was very young girls. And so, um, so everybody was around my age. We weren't really allowed to talk to each other. So I, I was just, I, I was just going to say to you, did you recognize any of the other girls? Was this brothel <laughs> near where you lived? Like, did anybody ever talk? Yeah, we weren't allowed to talk. We would pass each other in the halls, though, and I often talk about catching each other's eyes mm. and just seeing kind of the screams in in other people's eyes as I walked by. Um, that I, you know, that still haunts me. Yeah. Um, I can... But we no, we weren't allowed to communicate at all. Um, and be, you know, a brothel type setting, you, basically you're escorted to your room and you stay there for the night and then you're escorted out. So there wasn't really opportunity for that. Um, on the porn set, I had what would be considered, I don't know, a handler or an assistant, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and she would, um, like at the end of most nights on a porn set, I couldn't stand up by myself. And so she would help me off stage and usually clean me up um kind of wash me or whatever before i went home and i experienced that as kindness but um i don't know if it was looking back i'm like maybe it was just washing the evidence away i don't know but um but i experienced it as kindness but that's probably the most uh kindness i felt there um, well, mostly it felt like it was me against a whole set of people um, it, I often it was started. because you were a child, you know, and yeah. I'm just going to say my opinion, that is no kindness. We yeah. don't know her situation. Right. Yeah. Right. We don't know her backstory, but a child, you know, yeah. and especially a woman with a girl, I find really offensive. And that's what we're finding with the trafficking in New York. So many women are involved yeah. in this trafficking because they can act as the sister the mother figure uh, that a girl or a young woman might not have. Um, let's let's get in. Well, let me ask you another question. How did you go to school? You graduated high school. You were able to go to school. Yeah. How did this? How did this work? Well, the so the the underage brothel that tended to be just on weekends. Mm -hmm. So it was like they would set it up in this warehouse for the weekends. Um, so that didn't impact my school as much. Um, but the porn studio, we shot almost any night of the week. And so during um, the three years I was being trafficked there, I was really lacking sleep um, because we shot at night. And so, um, you know, I was missing a, a good chunk of my sleep. So I started most days in high school with um, a Diet Coke, two to four Vibrin, which are like caffeine pills. Right. I um, remember. Yeah. And Twix bar and like excedrin because i was in pain right my body was in pain um so yeah that's kind of how i i and uh, i don't know how you how said high school i mean i was smart enough that i didn't have to study too much i mean um so that was in my favor and i used time with school was kind of like a break from my trauma <laughs> So I had discovered writing when I was 15. And mm -hmm. so I just always pretended like I was taking notes and I was really just writing and like um, whatever, poetry, kind of journaling or whatever, but just kind of processing life in the way I could then. I didn't have the tools to do the deep processing of my trauma then, right. but I did excellent. what I could. But excellent though, that you were writing at least. Yeah. Right. Because writing is cathartic. And so let's get into the book. Uh, yeah. Coming of age on a porn set trafficked in porn at age 14. Why did you write it? How did you write it? Because it is triggering. I guess that is the word to use. Right, mm -hmm. Jewel? You know, it does drudge up all of this. Uh, tell us about this experience. 
Yeah, so I would. It was a five-year writing project, um, but I say it was a lifetime healing project to get mm-hmm. to that point where I could write it. And even as I wrote it, it was um, it was doing that deeper healing into that part of my story um, that I really barely survived, kind of on every level, both physically and emotionally. I I don't know. I'm interjecting again. I don't know how a child survives this. I I really don't. Like you know I. Yeah. physically, emotionally, um, but, but go ahead. I mean, you were so strong and, and it is to write the book, but again, you want to empower others. You want to let others know there's a path out and you're there to help. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I always feel like it was my purpose to write this part of my story. Um, which is the book is focused on those three years I was trafficked in porn. Um, and also it tells you enough of the rest of my story to make sense of it. Right. But it's focused on the three years I was trafficked in porn. And I always felt like it was my purpose to tell this, um, part of my story because it's a a story that's not being told very much yet. Um, we hear a lot about sex trafficking and there's a lot of survivors Mm -hmm. starting to come forth to tell their story. Um, but we don't hear a lot about survivors trafficked in porn telling their story. Um, there was a little bit. I mean, it really started with the porn hub, uh, trafficking hub campaign. Yes. That's where survivors started coming out to tell their story in that context. Um, but there's so many more that need to um, be telling their story. And um that was always the purpose of writing my book is to be able to have this conversation like we're having today about the issues that arise out of my story. Um, and so the, yes, so other survivors can come forth, but also so we as a culture can um, correct this um, way we're treating humans in porn um, because I was trafficked alongside adults, even though I was, a kid, a minor, 14 to 17, I was trafficked alongside adults and feeling the force that I felt of me against the crowd on that set. I know that other adults there were, were likely being trafficked as well. Um, and so people just need to understand um, both the myths they're believing about porn and how it operates and the dynamics um, of force, fraud and coercion that are happening on porn sets um, that are bringing harm to those involved and, um, and trafficking ultimately that more trafficking is happening in porn than we know. So, yeah. And I think that is like the number one thing people hear porn for some reason, I think Jewel, they think, Oh, people are doing this of their free will. Like, I I think that that's just how they think about it. Right. They don't, understand how to really take it apart or understand again we don't know backstories of like any people how they ended up there how that woman that you perceive as kindness who helped you at the end of a night you know we don't know she was probably trafficked for all we know held hostage for who knows blackmailed uh, we don't know her story um so it's very involved all of this but people have to wake up and and hear about these things right uh, yeah. They have to know the reality. We're about reality at the Warriors. Tell us about um, your work today. Give us yes. an idea of your life today. What's happening? Okay. So currently I work with Journey Out in Los Angeles. Um, we do, and my job is a survivor advocate. So I do crisis response to hospitals um, when they identify potential trafficking victims. And then I connect them to resources, which are usually shelter, um, which is actually the hardest thing in Los Angeles right now. I don't know about New York, but in Los Angeles, impossible. it's really hard to find shelter. And I mean, one night with um, one of the victims, I, um, I called 22 shelters with them and nobody had room. So um, it's just really (laughs) an intense environment to try to get shelter in. Um, But then we also have a drop-in center that has, um, clothes, food, hygiene products. And I usually have a backpack with me when I go to the hospital that has like a day's change of clothes as well as essential hygiene products. So that, um, and that's kind of the, um, the crisis response side of my job. And then I do training of hospital staff and, um, 
um, other things connected to um, to helping the survivors. We have a drop-in center, so I go and like meet the ongoing um, survivors there, and um, you know connect them to so many different resources they may need. Sometimes it's um, job or education or transportation. Just depends on each. Well, survivor. I have to say, Jewel, I am very angry. Okay, I'm really not an angry person. I am angry that. We know it's bad, all this stuff, right? We know, like, I'm tired of, um, not us, mind you. I'm tired of, like, other people. I'm involved in lots of coalitions here in New York. Everything's bipartisan, right? Human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. Okay, where are the resources? Where is the housing? Okay, in New York, mm -hmm. we have two places, basically. Three, if you count the Salvation Army. Limited beds. These are emergency situations, it's yeah. not like, you know, you, you, as well, you know, you know, somebody may have five minutes to get away from somebody. Um, I'm very angry. Our focus is not pushing forward to have more resources, more housing, more mentorship of building job training also. So somebody mm -hmm. doesn't go back to all they know to make a dollar is this trafficking because there's nothing for them. Right. So they're going to yeah. just slip back into what's comfortable, no matter how bad it is. They don't even know it's bad. Um, I've been I want your thoughts on this. I've been telling people lately, uh, listen, if you if if they have five minutes and they're trying to get away from their trafficker, their pimp, try to get yourself to a hospital emergency room because they're open 24-7. Yeah. Right? Because mm -hmm. we've got hotlines, we got this, we got that. They're not picking up. They don't move fast enough. Uh, I had somebody who was like, she said press number four, press number five. She didn't have the time. She literally yeah. had this one little slight window to get away. Do you think that's a good idea? to try to yeah. get one to a hospital? It is. I mean, that's kind of what my, the survivor advocate program is based on. Um, yeah, it's still, it's still difficult to get housing, but right. it's a good idea for someone to go Just there temporarily till they can, to be safe. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Because, safe place. Yeah, because we have too many problems, you know, even calling 911 these days, uh, not responding. Yeah not considered an emergency. That's another program. Like, so yeah. like, where do you go if you have five or 10 minutes? Yeah, so I was saying get to a hospital emergency room because at least they're open. Um, Interestingly enough, I don't know if you know them, Nurses United Against Human Trafficking. Do you know this group? I, I'm not, no, I don't know that name specifically. Oh, you should know them. I'll connect you. I'm Dr. Fran Bononeri, uh, Tammy Tony Butler. They did an excellent, two women did an excellent study uh, about 18 months ago they did a survey anonymous across the entire United States and um, both sexual assault nurse examiners and loads of other credits as well. But um, Tammy herself is a survivor of childhood uh, mm. sex trafficking by her father. Mm. They got, they did this study jewel. I'm going to send it to you. And the response was uh, 48 States responded. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And all uh, nurses, nurses in training, healthcare workers across the United States. And it was like 98% of them, it was 97 point something, said they are not adequately trained to recognize a human trafficking, a sex traffic, the labor traffic, whatever. You, even though all of these places pretty much said, you know, here's a 15 minute video to watch as the healthcare provider. Here's a, a you know, a quiz you can take. Um, what, what are you hearing? Because I found this to be shocking that th there was no government study on all of this. Okay. So these two did it on their own. I find this shocking. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I always um, present, whether I'm going to like a huddle, which is like their team meeting in a hospital or um, doing a formal training, but I always focus on like the red flags. Um, I know there's some like in the movements, uh, human trafficking movement. There's some, some people say that, you know, don't focus on the red flags, but it actually people need to know the red flags. As long as you tell them that it's just a sign, right. That something could be happening. And, um, um, kind of like a red light, it tells you to stop for a second and, and start a trauma informed conversation. And, um, I but I'm, confused. That, I'm confused, Jewel. I'm interrupting again. I'm sorry. Like, okay. why are they telling you not to look at that red light, that red flag, that perhaps indicator? I, I don't understand. Well, I why are they telling in you? In the movement, I've heard a lot like, 
they feel like you're going to miss people if you're just focused on these 10 red flags or something like that. But I do find that it's helpful to, um, to get, it's something that people can notice um, mm-hmm. that, that helps them stop and start a trauma informed conversation. Of course you need the conversation mm-hmm. um, to figure out what's going on in their life. Um, and of course you're still, you know, those 10 red flags may not pick up everybody, but like, um, it gives you a place to start from. And I think that's what we're always looking for is a place to start from. And my experience in training hospital staff is, yeah, there's a long ways to go. (laughs) Even when we have this program and we're training people that helps. um, But still, there's a long ways to go. And we even still will have people asking, you know, things like, um, for example, like, remember the Wayfair thing, (laughs) where they're like, People are being trafficked on Wayfair. And I'm like, no, they really that, aren't. Wasn't that over like three years ago? That was. A- yeah. But I mean, there's those kind of myths that pop up that people ask. And, and, and see I'm how like, the public focus is that that sticks in their minds. Yeah. That Wayfair. Yeah. When we want other things to stick in their mind. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Not the, the, I, I kind of call it low hanging fruit for some reason, yeah. like something like the Wayfair story is easy to. Um, I guess digest. It sounds something, you know, recently I'm digressing a bit, you know, we had the, um, Oh, what was it called? Just like a month ago, they were going to strike all the, all the, uh, ports. Do you remember that? We had the port here. We have a big one, uh, port Newark, which is right outside of New York city. So all the, all the workers were going to go on strike. Oh, geez. I'm losing this talk about old age. I'm losing my mind. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? They were all going to go on strike the different ports around the United States, uh, the Baltimore Mm -hmm. port, the New York, Right away, people in New York started saying, now get ready, Jewel. Is it true? Because a lot of people contacted me. This really isn't a strike. They're going to take, it's all filled with shipping containers by New York, yeah. like the whole port. Is it true? This They're just stopping because all the missing unaccompanied minors, they're going to ship them out now in shipping containers across the world. And I just blow it off. Like I don't, you know, even go yeah. near it. I don't try to explain. I don't try to... Like, uh, I'm just like, no. And I move on. Like, I don't, I don't even address it, but how they got to that more than a couple of people from what we talk about, I just find like kind of shocking, you know, it's that low hanging fruit, but, um, what the other thing about getting back to, um, a hospital emergency room or a healthcare facility, they also tell us healthcare providers because there's not a full protocol. Mm-hmm. You know, so they, they'll slap the bandaid on. I say that like lack, you know, for lack of a big story, like because they're not connected into like law enforcement. They don't have a full program. They're not connected into a, a shelter. I, that's where you come in. But then when I hear you're you're calling 22 places and can't find a bed, what what do you do in that instance? Well, there's I mean, there's kind of there's nothing to do because also. I mean, well, in that instance, actually, I did find a place that could accept them tomorrow. And then the hospital cooperated with me and let them stay overnight. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to ask. Would the hospital let somebody stay like 24 hours, perhaps? Yeah. And so I guess it's case by case. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the hospitals I work with can do like a 24 hour or 48 hour um, trafficking bed, right? But sometimes that's not enough to get somebody in place. And a complicating factor is that in Los Angeles, we have this huge homeless population that has also learned if they say the word trafficking, they get services. And so mm-hmm. I had to work into my intake, like how, how long have you been homeless? And a lot of times, I mean, not a lot of times, but maybe say 20% of the time I get like 10 years or more is what they'll say. And so then that's a whole other issue that needs to yeah. be in differently. Um, I'll still help them, but they need to be helped differently than um, somebody who's on the run from a trafficker, right? Because they're they're having trouble staying housed. And so just putting them in a shelter is not going to solve that situation that they've been uh, um, interacting with for 10 years, right? Wow. I never, um, I never thought of that, Jewel like somebody who's homeless is now saying trafficking, nor have I ever heard that from anybody in New York talking about that. That is, 
always something new, right? Always, always somebody figuring out how to get ahead, use the system, do something. I mean, we feel bad for all people, but yeah. really, um, finish us up with what, um, do you need from the public? What do you want from the public? You know, give us some final words. Um, well, I think the most important things that we can do is hear a variety of survivor stories, right? Mm -hmm. And really connect with them. Like I wrote my book, even though it has a lot of trauma in it, I wrote it with the intention of people being able mm -hmm. to stay connected as they read my story. Um, because that's where change happens. When we're connected to each other as humans, then, um, then we see really what they need, right? Because we feel it in, inside of us. And, um, and that's all that I'm asking when it comes to changes, um, like in how humans are treated in porn. I'm not asking porn to go away. I'm just saying everybody that's in it needs to be tre treated humanely um, and be able to live a life free of harm. So, yeah. And I'm going to add it's 2024, if you don't mind, Jewel, and everybody yeah. can and must do something in there's something everybody can do in all these areas of support. I just think we're in an environment now. It's like a new country, a new world. This yeah. is it. It's really our community creates change hashtag. We have to honor that. Well, I want everybody coming of age on a porn set trafficked in porn at age 14. Again, we're going to have all the links all about you, all your social media handles, Jewel, uh, in the body of the video. I want everybody to get this book. Uh, we've got holidays coming up. Either buy a book and pass it on. I like to say pay it forward or buy two books, buy a book as a gift because books make wonderful gifts and books that educate, I think make even better books. So Jewel Baraka, thank you so much for joining us today, taking the time, your commitment, your dedication to helping others. I mean, it's truly um, the meaning of being a warrior. And I can't say enough, except the warriors, we are here to support you. Let us speak again soon. There are so many issues to speak about. And yeah. just thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I mean, God bless you. I mean, really, I have to say that because uh, you are doing the real work. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the conversation. I really enjoyed it. So, Thanks, Jewel.